Please welcome Dr. Jochen Lauterbach. If you can't see me, imagine your life without electricity. Well, some of you, you may have that quaint picture in your mind. Sorry, it's a good start. <laughs> we go. Ha! There's my fireplace. All right, let me start all over again. Some of you may have this wonderful quaint picture in their mind of wood crackling in a fireplace, some romantic candlelight, and that's great in January. But then wait, we live in South Carolina, and July will come around. And in July, things will look a little different. Or maybe they'll look the same, <laughs> depending on the, sorry, the clicker is not working. Oh, the clicker is working with a 10 second time delay. That's going to be hard. Uh, okay. So July will come around and we're all very happy that we have air conditioning. Imagine July here without air conditioning. Imagine how productive and how comfortable you would be. And air conditioning is run off electricity. And there are many other daily conveniences that we're used to that run off electricity. In fact, you could argue everything we use runs off electricity these days. Could we have a Gamecock game at night? No, we couldn't because the stadium will be dark. Not as dark as the screen, there we go. <laughs> but it will be dark, and there was an event like that at a recent Super Bowl game, and you see that the game had to stop. And we have a lot of other appliances. There wouldn't be a stove, we'd be cooking with wood, all the other gadgets that you use in your household. And just think about all the medical advances. How would you take an x-ray of a broken bone without being able to plug your x-ray machine into an outlet and have reliable electricity? You couldn't make drugs that we have invented without electricity. So it's no surprise that a recent survey of the National Academy of Sciences has elected electrification as the number one technological accomplishment in the 20th century. Ahead of a lot of other very nice accomplishments like the automobile or the internet or health technologies. Now you may ask, why is the automobile, what does that have to do with electricity? Why do we need electricity for all of these inventions? Well, would you have gasoline to run your car on? No, because we need electricity to get the crude oil out of the ground. We need it to refine it. And when you go to the gas pump, it's running off electricity. And if we switch over from regular car to electric cars, wait, we're going to need a lot more electricity than what we use at this point. So I like to compare electricity to the Titan Atlas, who carries the world on its shoulders. And that's really what electricity does for us. It's there for us, it carries the world, and if we didn't have electricity, the world as we know it would crumble and would come to an end. We have about 7.2 billion people on our planet, and about one and a half billion of those have no access to electricity at this point. And about another four billion use a lot less electricity than what we use in the top 10 or 20 countries in terms of electricity usage in, in, in the world. So how much electricity do we really use? And I thought I'll make it understandable by just taking the audience here. Don't worry, I'm not gonna put you in a hamster wheel. I'm not even gonna make you get up. 
but imagine the electricity that you use in one day. Just the audience in here. And now let's think about a marathon runner and we put this chap into a hamster wheel and we let him run for four hours. I think this is an okay time for a marathon. If you look at me, clearly I'm not an expert in marathon runner. And we let him, let him run for four hours. How many marathon runners in this hamster wheel do you think we need to make the electricity that you guys used today together? One, ten, 100, 1,000, 10,000? We're getting closer. We're between 10 to 15,000 marathon runners. Have to be in a hamster wheel like this for four hours every day to produce the electricity that this audience has used today. That's a huge number. And it's a huge number of electricity, of energy, that we consume every day. So where does it come from? It comes out of the wall, right? There's this really convenient thing called an outlet. You take your cell phone charger, you plug it in, the cell phone charges. Great. And we never really think about the infrastructure behind that outlet until, of course, we're out of electricity, something goes wrong, and then we start complaining. Why is my power out? Why can't I open my garage door? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? So let's look a little bit behind that plug, and let's look how we make electricity. This is 2012 in our country. And if you look at this, coal, gas, nuclear, there's about 80% of the electricity we use is from something we dig out of the ground. It could be uranium, it could be coal, then we burn it and we make electricity with it. And this is a horribly inefficient process. The best we can do right now, about a third of what we dig out of the ground ends up in useful electricity and two thirds of it we just throw away as waste heat into our environment. Hydropower is another option, and you see we have a fairly large part of hydropower in the U.S. But the bigger problem is, where are the renewables? Where is photovoltaics? Where is wind? Where is geothermal? There's this little wedge up there. You see that little green wedge? This is all the renewables together in our country that we use to, do ele to generate electricity. Now let's compare ourselves with the perceived world leader in renewable electricity generation. I'm from Germany originally, so it has to be Germany. <laughs> so here's the German pie. And you can read in the, in the news that they've broken a new world record on renewable energy and all that. But if you look at it, they still make over three quarters of their electricity with the same way we make it. So yes, the solar and wind pie is larger, but the hydropower pie is smaller, so in the end it's actually not much different than, than what we're doing. So when we burn things, we create emissions. We create a lot of emissions. Just assume we take this carbon dioxide emissions from New York from one day, and we fill balloons with them. This is the pile of balloons you're gonna get. This is just the city of New York for one day, the carbon dioxide gas. And about a third of that comes from electricity generation, a third of that from traffic, and a third of that from home heating and other burning, again, of fossil fuels. Now, even if you argue that carbon dioxide has really no effect on our planet, and there's a lot of arguing going on about those things, there are some more direct health effects that we're all dealing with. One example is mercury poisoning in fish. Mercury comes from the coal. And although there are technologies in place to reduce the emissions, we still emit a lot of mercury. And you go to Lake Murray, and you catch a fish, and you eat it, all that bioaccumulate mercury in the fish will end up in your body. And if you eat a lot of those fish, you're going to have the mercury and you're going to have to deal with the long-term health effects of it. Another example is acid rain. Now, I grew up in northern Bavaria, and there were a lot of trees there, more trees than people, definitely. 
and we had mountains. And when I was a kid, the trees on a lot of the mountains looked like this. They were dying. And this was caused by the emissions of industry, of power plants that were sometimes hundreds of miles away from where we grew up. This process has been reversed. New technologies have been developed by scientists and engineers to catch those emissions and to reverse, and to reverse this process. So it's doable to a certain extent to reverse the negative impacts. There's a lot of people that write about those negative impacts. You can go to Amazon and you can buy tons of books. And those books are typically somewhere between pseudoscience and fear-mongering. And, and, and they try to strike the fear into our hearts. And they're going to tell us our earth is hot, flat, and crowded. This is going to happen. It's all going to be catastrophic. And you can, of course, leave it to Hollywood to show us how a world without electricity is really going to look like. Right? They're doing a good job. And sometimes when I look at those pictures, I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe that's the direction we're heading. We don't know at this point. So what do our politicians do? What long-term vision, what long-term strategy do we have in this country when it comes to energy? Well, let's look at a couple ends of the rainbow. Here's one end of the political rainbow. You could argue it's not really the end, but somewhere on one side of the political rainbow, and we're told that green energy sustainability is our future. Then we go to the other end of the political rainbow, and we're being told that coal is our future. And then we go to the extreme end of the rainbow, and <laughs> we're being told that carbon dioxide is harmless. It doesn't matter. There's absolutely no reason to worry about any of those emissions here. So what we see here is that everybody is pushing their agenda. Everybody's trying to steer the ship in their direction. And there's no solution, really, that is long-term, long-term, I mean century and longer, that is comprehensive and that includes all the options that we need to look into. So what are our options if we want to get away from hydrocarbon fuels. And I'm not advocating that we will. Coal, gas, they're going to be around for the next 100, 150 years. They must be part of the mix. Whoever tells you we can get rid of them in 20 years is not telling you the truth, but is pushing his or her agenda. What are our options? Well, we can look at hydropower. There's a picture missing of a dam. It's supposed to be up there. It's obviously the dam at night. <laughs> After the electricity went out. Because the lake behind the dam was empty. That is one of the issues with hydropower. Hydropower relies on rain. It relies on the existence of water. And even if you look over to Lake Murray, I mean, we're pretty close to that dam. That dam barely ever runs at full capacity. And if it does, it produces the electricity of about a quarter of a coal power plant. So if you look at the area that that, that lake encompasses and the electricity we get out of it, it's not very impressive. How about we burn biomass? That's one option, right? We can burn biomass. The problem here is that there's a lot of emissions. The giant brown haze that covers most of Asia every winter is actually called from burning biomass, not from coal power plants as the media want us to believe. And we also want to do other things with this biomass. We want to make biofuels from it. We want to feed our animals. We want to feed ourselves. And there's a limited amount of land mass that we have where we can grow that biomass. So maybe not. So let's look at the third one that is obviously also in the dark. I don't know where they all are. All right. So there's two more. At the bottom left, there's a bunch of windmills, okay? Wind is the fastest growing energy sector in the US right now. But of course, if you grow from almost nothing, you can grow very quickly. And 
wind has an impact on local communities from the low frequency hum that's emitted by the wind power to the reason you probably heard on the news that eagles are getting their heads chopped off and all that when they fly into the windmill. So there's clearly an impact on local wildlife. And the pie in the sky still is solar. We're really starting to put solar into place, but solar has one problem that occurs every 24 hours, the sun sets. And when the sun sets, the output of your solar power plant goes from high output to nothing. And we need to deal with that because we can't tell people the sun in Arizona sets at 6.30, so you're going to have to turn off your TV and everything else at 6.30 because that's when most people turn their TV on. So we have a problem there. And what we need is we need energy storage for 300 million people for a couple days because we also want to make sure that when the weather is bad for three days, we don't have to tell people to turn off everything. And that is a monumental task that we need to accomplish. So how can we do that? Well, right now, we need to develop more new technologies, and we will go down a wrong path once in a while. But long term, we will find our way, and long term, we will invent new technologies that will help us. Because the other options are drastic changes to our lifestyles, which is not popular. And the probably least popular option is to decrease uh, human mankind, the population, by 60%, 70%. So right now, our country spends about, give or take, $3 billion on energy research. That's fundamental and applied energy research together. And you think, that's a lot of money. Well, let's put this in perspective a little bit. The Apollo program was about $30 billion in today's dollars per year. And I would argue that was the last time our country really put their minds to solving a problem. And you can all contribute by drinking one six-pack less per year. Because that's, that's about what it would take to double our energy research. Now, again, as I said, I'm from Bavaria. So don't drink a six-pack less of Bavarian beer. Take the bad stuff. <laughs> but you see, even a small change like this could make a dramatic impact. So our energy problems are growing. And even if we go outside and we don't see them, and we're sitting here in this theater, and we have all those lights on and a semi-functional PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> Uh, we're starting to reach a point where we have to think about our future. And I'm not talking about the future five minutes down the road, five hours, five months down the road. I'm thinking about the great-grandchildren of my 12-year-old at home. I'm worried about her. But we need to act now. We can't wait until the problems really come and then react. We have to act at this point. We have to change our minds. The problems are growing, and we really have a choice if our kids want to grow up in an environment like this or if they want to grow up in a clean environment in the future. But this can only happen if we care now. So as Americans, we do care about a lot of things. We run 5Ks for breast cancer research. We care about homeless pets and everything, but I've never seen anybody run a 5K for energy. <laughs> you know, energy is there. It's something, it's a commodity. We have it, and it's there every day. And we don't worry about where it comes from and what impact it has on our lives, unless, of course, the electricity bill comes. And then we complain about it. So I think, forward-looking, 50, 100 years down the road, we're going to have to have a massive effort now, a matter of national pride, to move this country, to position this country so we have a clear future when it comes to our energy options. The 20th century used cheap and abundant electricity, all of you, to enhance and prolong human life. Just think about all the wonderful medical advances that have been made. 
The 21st century will be about sustaining that momentum. And it will be about creating an energy future that will be good for all of us and that will be good for our children and our children's children. Thank you very much.